In the RRC, the Recovery Revolution community, we have some amazing online meetings, and one of those is our Dao Recovery Meeting. In this meeting, one chapter of the Dao De Ching is discussed every week as to how it relates to recovery. I hope you enjoy this week's podcast episode. Hey guys, Buddy C. This is the August 29th, 2019 Dao De Ching meeting for the what are we? Reco- the Recovery, Recovery Revolution, Revolution community. community. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. RRC. RRC. Okay. Okay, let's uh, – I'll welcome everyone first today. We've got Cindy L. and Marla H. and Kate E., Paul H., Sarah P. Good to have everyone today. Uh, Sarah's new, and Cindy does not normally get to be here, so glad everyone's here today. You know, my question in my meditation has become – it's really a question to me. Am I going to let my higher power love me today? Uh, Or am I going to continue to get in the way of that? Am I going to continue to insist on having my own way? Am I going to continue to just be my own worst enemy, really? You know, Uh, since I listened to Manus Friedman on uh, Rabbi Manus on, on that, about being needy, am I the needy one, or is God the needy one? Once I, the way I looked at that, I thought, well, God, God is love, so He needs someone to love. Am I going to let Him love me today? And I just can't get off that. I mean, every time I go to meditate, that is exactly what I go to. Or during the day when I have a moment, you know, of, of quiet, it's hmm, you know, it's like it's truly is. I am my own worst enemy. I am the one that's in my way. This is not happening uh, because of my efforts. If it's not happening, it's because of my efforts. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it's my efforts that are getting in the way, this effort of control and making it all work the way I think it needs to. That whole. You know, this chapter talks about not speaking when you don't know anything, it's the same with thoughts. I don't believe my thoughts because they're not true. I have opinions, I have judgments, and they're usually based on my own perspective. No one else's. So they're not necessarily the right perspective. And and I believe this chapter is about, this is a description of what uh, really walking in the Tao, walking in your virtue walking walking that that way is like and that's what this is to me is a real description of that you know Mm -hmm. so so let's uh move forward and what i'll do we have a good crowd so i'm going to mute everyone and if you've got something to say i'm going to ask you to unmute so i will know to call on you because when we get a group like this, it's sometimes it's difficult people uh, to, to get their comments in. So I'm going to mute everybody so that if you uh, if you want to say something, unmute for me, and that will help me out to know to call on you. Other than Kate, I'm not going to mute Kate today because I'm going to get Kate to read for us. Do you have the link up, dear? I put it in the chat. Yeah, I got it. Okay, well, I'm going to share the screen, and we're on the 56th chapter so we'll go into our readings and then we'll discuss it so you can you can start whenever you're ready dear all right i will begin those who know do not talk those who talk do not know keep your mouth closed guard your senses temper your sharpness simplify your problems mask your brightness Be at one with the dust of the earth. This is primal union. He who has achieved this state is unconcerned with friends and enemies, with good and harm, with honor and disgrace. This, therefore, is the highest state of man. Second translation. Those who know don't talk. Those who talk don't know. Close your mouth. Block off your senses. 
Blunt your sharpness, untie your knots, soften your glare, settle your dust. This is the primal identity. Be like the Tao. It can't be approached or withdrawn from, benefited or harmed, honored or brought into disgrace. It gives itself up continually. That is why it endures. Third translation. Those who know do not talk. Those who talk do not know. Stop talking. Meditate in silence. Blunt your sharpness. Release your worries. Harmonize your inner light and become one with the dust. Doing this is called the dark and mysterious identity. Those who have achieved the mysterious identity cannot be approached and they cannot be alienated. They cannot be benefited nor harmed. They cannot be made noble nor to suffer disgrace. This makes them the most noble of all under the heavens. Final translation. Those who know don't talk. Those who talk don't know. Shut your mouth. Be still. Relax. Let go of your worries. Stay out of the spotlight. Be at one with the world and get right with the Tao. If you get right with Tao, you won't be worried about praise or scorn, about winning or losing, about honor or disgrace. That's the way to be. That's the way to be. I've got the link in the chat. So if you guys want to pull that up separately, so to look at that, it's the way to be. Didn't say the way to act or the way to do, but the way to be. That is just jam packed full of stuff. Any comments before I start rattling? Okay, um, you know, they say this is the most quoted verse, this, out of the whole Tao Te Ching, those who know do not talk, and those that talk do not know. I remember the first time that I ever knew something but did not have the urge to let everyone know that I knew it. That's a real, that, that's just happened I don't put a time on it. Last couple of three years when I really just said, it's not important they know I, that I know that. <laughs> because it was always important before for me to direct every conversation in my direction. That if I had something to add, it was very important they knew that I had some knowledge on that. So I, you know, my ego and self was so strong in that area that is uh that's a real gift when you start relaxing with those things and you don't have to draw every conversation to make it about you you don't have to always be the best look the best that's uh, uh back to that for me it's back to that having doing being business you know how i think that we progress uh, we we start out with this having then we uh, progress to to doing and then ultimately we progress to just being that we don't have to you know first we think it's in the things that we can get having stuff then we kind of progress from there up i think to to doing that we want to help that we feel we can make a difference and we can nothing wrong with that but we start moving from that to just being just doing the next right thing you know just being that not having to have it even mean anything or go toward something huge or greater it's just the next right thing to do and we we move to this this being and i think we have different parts of our lives that that happens in and it happens at different times in different areas. But this idea of this is just the way to be. It's just the way to be. Keep your mouth closed. Stop talking. I think it brings a lot of integrity. And humil- it's talking about humility, having the humility to know you don't know anything also. 
you don't know what you don't know. But also having a lot of integrity and keeping, you know, without, you, you can just be without having to let yourself be known. You know, that's humility. Without having a reward for all of the things you think you've done that are great, you know, or things you think you say that are great. You you know, just that, yeah. Without reward, without needing a reward of recognition or whatever. My daily, um, one of my daily quotes the other day, I try to do a quote a day to think about. And my quote was, except being unimportant. And I was like, I don't want to accept. I don't want to be unimportant. <laughs> I want to be important by God. And I want everyone to know it. <laughs> but learning that, you know, the the greatest gift in life for me is when I don't make life about me. That it's not making Buddy the center of the universe. That's where Buddy used to be. And Buddy had all this angst because he could not be the center of the universe. I fought continually to try to make it that way. Never was. But I fought continually to make it that way. And, and surrendering that. And that's part of this, is just learning just to be. And I think this, this verse is just a description of, uh, of a sage. Uh, of, of, well, it says the high state of man. Uh, this is the high state. So we have a description here of what that looks like. First, we know that if we're in this state, that we probably listen more than we talk, that we don't always have to share everything we know for the sake of sharing. You know how the know-it-all just gets, they just get on my nerves. They have to know every, and they have to let you know they know it. Um, not being that. How about this part about stop talking, meditate in silence, be still, relax. There was no part of that in my pre-recovery life. There was no be still and relax. I was wasting time. I was being still and relaxing I had to make it happen that reminds me of a Gandhi quote uh, he said he had so much to do he was real busy he said gosh I've got so much to do to I don't know if he said gosh but I have so much to do today <laughs> that maybe I need to meditate two hours instead of one <laughs> that's what this is talking about it's really the sage, the wise one here, lives in a, at a point of surrender, really. Blunt your sharpness, untie your knots. Those things we're going to talk about with Wayne Dyer. He goes into good detail on those. Soften your glare. Settle your dust. You're not in a rush. You're not in a hurry. How about in a conversation when it's getting heated? If you're in a conversation and it's starting to, you know, the levels of volume are rising with every sentence, if you just slow down, if you quiet, it just takes that energy out, you know. There's something to the softening, settling. Be like the Tao. It can't be approached or withdrawn from it can't be benefited or harmed honored or brought into disgrace now listen to this it gives itself up continually that is why it endures it's back to this giving again you know i i, I wish there was a part of this that I could stay in charge, but I can't. I have got to be, if, if I want to be at peace and want to be, I have got to learn to give in everything, in every interaction. Because any, any interaction that I'm wanting to get in some way, I am not 
living in the Tao. I'm not surrendering my will and life, if you will put it in, in recovery terms. I'm not surrendering my will and life in that regard because I'm in control. I mean, think about it. You can take any interaction, doesn't matter what it is, and you can say it can be either you're giving in that interaction or you're wanting something from them. You're wanting to get in every interaction. It doesn't matter what it is for me riding down the road and pushing the person in front of me or or pushing against the person that's pushing me from behind. It doesn't matter. I can either be an open heart to people or I can have this shell of resistance where I'm pushing against everyone. And it's that way for me in every interaction, no matter what the interaction right now. Is the same way. I can have a heart to give to you guys, or I can be wanting to pull from y'all and, you know, wanting to look spiritual, all those things that we can do within ourselves. But it's like that all the time with every interaction. Think about it. And I guarantee you, if you look at interactions where you have fight or angst or there's issue, You can look at those interactions and you can see where if you're, if there's an issue, you're probably wanting to get in that interaction rather than give. Marla? Just think about um, conversing with my husband, who's a highly anxious person and his his voice raises at every, everything we talk about. And I sit back and try and relax him. You know, I tell like, calm down. There's nothing major going on here, you know. Because he wants, his ego is so big. He wants him, he wants to be known. And he wants to be right. And I want to be right. <laughs> you know, well, that's, that's everyday life is my significant other. Is your, is your husband's name, no, I can't, your husband's name can't be Anna. That's my wife's name. <laughs> They're the no. same, like the same person. <laughs> it's funny though because she gives it away because when her voice starts raising, I I know now. I say, uh oh, I got, I have to figure this out because I don't want to go there. Used to, you know, we could go there and enjoy it a while, you know, and enjoy yeah. the fight, you know. But I don't enjoy that anymore. You know? I don't enjoy that at all. And uh, you know, he, it's just he makes a big deal. He's he has a lot of anxiety about a lot, which is just fear. And, um, you know, I try really try and assuage his fear a lot. But. Well, you know, my wife's an accountant, and we're finishing up our taxes for last year. Uh, we always file the extensions and all that. So we're finishing that up to get it in on time. And it's a time of the year that if we fight the entire year, it's over taxes. Because she she's a good accountant, but when she does my taxes, we always have a conflict. And it always happens, and I decided last year that we were not going to get in a fight on taxes. So we were working, and she had, there was something that had been left out, and so, you know, the accountant was calling me about, you know, all these things. And so so usually I would be fuss, 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 push, 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 and I, and I just told her, I said, honey, I said, thank you for all your hard work. We're not going to fight over this. Let's figure it out. And we did not get in a fight. And, you know, the fight would be the big blow up. We would fuss. You know, I'd sleep on the couch that night or in one of the other bedrooms. I mean, it would be like this big deal that took, you know, a day to figure, you know, to, and then, you know, all those things, you know, you just compounds, you know. And I just said, no, I'm not doing that this year. And we got through it. I'll give myself a B. I got a little ill with her, but we recovered, you know. So, oh, it is. That, that's the thing, Marla. This, this is learning how to be. Yeah. You know, it really is learning how to give. It doesn't say the sage gave occasionally. <laughs> or, it says uh, the Tao gives itself up continually. <laughs> continually. 
that's the practice is giving continually. I can relate to uh, kind of this idea in terms of when I am at work, I am sitting there trying to respond to a client. They, they want some help with something. But I have this double layer. So part of me is like, I want to help them. I want to respond in the best way I can to help them. That's the, like the good part of myself. And then part of myself is thinking, you know, I want to respond in a way that sounds good. That if they report back to their counselor or my boss, like Kate said something really good and helpful to me. And she's a really great employee. You know, so I have like this this double like intention where you know if my intention was fully like where it ought to be I would just be thinking entirely of what the best thing to help them would be and that actually would be the best thing you know Mm -hmm that would be for them but I still have like this insecurity where I'm not being relaxed where I'm not going down that path we were just talking about what with the sage and everything where I have these other intentions like oh I have to look good I have to sound like I know what I'm talking about ego it's, you're human right. Right. you're human it's an ego thing yeah Kate, for me, what, what, what's happened in those situations is that I've had, I'll get situations come up where I've had to help someone that, that would be against what would make me look good. So I'd have to choose, do I look good here or do I help this person? You're going to have those come up. I guarantee it now that we're talking about this. I'm sorry. It's going to be a tough week for you. I mean, you're going to have those. It's going to happen. Uh, we yeah. want to hear about it, but it always does. Paul, you got something, sir? Yeah, this discussion just reminds me of a little anecdote or a joke. My uh, kind of a Buddhist type joke a friend just recently sent me. And I had to print it out because I didn't want to screw it up. It's pretty short. Uh, there was a very strict order of monks who lived by a rule that permitted speaking only once on one day a year, one monk per year. So when the day came around, the monk whose turn it was stood up and said, I don't like the mashed potatoes here. They're too lumpy. And he sat down. A year later, another monk stood up and said, I rather like the mashed potatoes here. They're very tasty. Another year went by, and it was a third monk's turn. He stood up and said, I'm leaving the monastery. I can't stand this constant bickering. (laughs) So it just goes to show you, even the monks have this problem. (laughs) <laughs> but you know none of those comments were a giving comment though that was all a getting comment true true you know i mean that's what I, that, that just proves the point of what we're talking about you know it's never about getting our own way when we learn to surrender our way then we get what we really need I'm, I've seen that over and over in my life. Cindy, you have something to Yeah, I was just going to say I can identify with what Kate's saying. I mean, in my job, it's, you know, hospitals are all about surveys now. You know, did your nurse explain everything to you? Did your nurse control your pain? Did your nurse do this? Did your nurse do this? And when they train you now, it's all about the buzzwords. You know, are you using the buzzwords to make sure that the patient knows that you actually did what you said you were going to do? And sometimes you can get caught up in like, like, am I, I don't know how to explain it, but it's like, am I following the policy or am I doing the right thing? Like, am I making sure I'm saying the right word or am I actually doing the right thing by the patient? Because sometimes I can do the right thing by the patient and not have used the right buzzword to go with it. And it's actually more important that they get the care than it is that I use the right buzzword. And it gets to where you're it's like you're viewing your actions through somebody else's eyes all the time to see whether or not you're actually doing what you're supposed to be doing instead of just doing what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. At least for me. Mm -hmm. And I think Cindy, if you can take that letting go book again, pathway to surrender, David Hawkins really has helped me with this. 
if I can take my consciousness up up from you know out of fear, let's say I could very if I was in that position, I could very easily be in a place of fear that they're going to give me a bad uh, review. Mm-hmm. So I'm making all these decisions out of fear. You're helping the person, but you're really doing it from fear. You're not right. doing it from a higher level of acceptance, accepting what you know how they think about you or or love even. So if you can move that up to where it's, it's love that you're working out of, that you're that you're doing this because you love this person, that you open your heart to this person, then I think all those other things just unfold for you. And, and I think most of the time they do, when I get a patient family that's difficult, I immediately am thinking, well, this is going to be on a survey. <laughs> I better watch my ass. And it is, it's fear. And then I start to operate from that. Am I, am I doing what they need me to do as opposed to am I doing what I need to do? And you start you usually get out of that, but. Yeah, you start resisting. You know, you go, whoa, I got to put my shell up here. How can I protect myself? Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I want you to try something. The next time that you're conscious of that, just send love to each of those people and open your heart to them instead of resist them and see what the result is. I'm curious to know. Yeah, I will. And see what the, and I guarantee you, if you learn to practice that, that you'll start seeing it just take care of itself. And it'll all work out much better than your fear could cause it to. Because when you're afraid, oh, I've learned this from A Course in Miracles. You know, <laughs> when you're afraid and have that block, you're going to get fear back. And when, yes. you, when you come from love, you're going to get love back. Because you, you don't get what you say. You get the consciousness that you're on. So it's, it's different. Because you can say the right words, but be in fear. You're going to get a reflection back of what you're giving. Right, right. So, um, okay. but that try that. I, I, I'm, I would be curious to know how that worked for you. I've got a sponsee that's doing that with his children right now. When he's correcting them, I'm, and they're like three and five. And I listen, when you correct them instead of out of anger or out of fear that they're going to hurt themselves, I said, just take a moment, meditate, and send love to the kids, and then try to do that from a place of love instead. And see if you don't get a different response. It's a good idea. It's all about our consciousness level, <laughs> I think, because we get those things back. And that, that's, what's, that's what's happened for me. I experiment on my wife all the time. And, and I, when I started doing that with her, I've talked about this before, mm-hmm. when I started coming from a place of love, her actions, what she heard and what she saw was different. Then, it, then with the same actions out of a lower level of consciousness, out of duty or whatever, you know, that, uh, you know, if I had a fear of her leaving me, if I didn't do whatever, you know, do my part, uh, which I didn't really have that, but I had, you know, it was more of a duty kind of thing. But when I brought that up to love, her response was different, even though my actions looked the same. So I think that that, I would think that would work on any level about anything. Yeah, I'll try it. Yeah, try it. Let us know. Yeah, buddy, I've been doing that with my boss. Oh, okay, good. About the last six or eight months. It's funny because one of my coworkers came in the other day and he said he was all upset. And I could tell he'd been in an argument with the boss. And uh, he said, how come he never yells at you? (laughs) And I said, well, maybe it's how you talk to him. You know, maybe it's how you're treating him that causes his reaction. Did you get that from the letting go book? Yeah, I did. Yeah. That, and, uh, that, I've been, I've been, yeah. That book is really, really done wonders for me. So I highly recommend it. Oh yeah. It's good. So again, that's pathway to surrender David Hawkins and I would get the audio and play the audio in the background. That's exactly what I do. Good. I'm glad it works for you. Okay, Stephen Mitchell. Did I miss anyone? Everyone got in their comments? Okay. Um, Those who know don't talk. They don't talk for the sake of talking or to prove something or to display themselves. This is Stephen Mitchell's comments, the, the guy that did the second translation. 
They talk only if it's appropriate and if they feel like talking. Those who talk don't know. This is ignorance, not the openness of not knowing. So that's, he agrees. That's good. How about Wayne Dyer? Have I forgotten any? No, we, we've hit everything so far. For me, the idea of this giving up continually, though, is huge. All right, I'm going to. Marla, you ready, dear? Yeah, 56 verse. Wayne Dwyer. Those who know do not talk. Those who talk do not know. Block all the passages. Close your mouth. Cordon off your senses. Blunt your sharpness. Untie your knots. Soften your glare. Settle your dust. This is primal union or the secret embrace. One who knows this secret is not moved by attachment or aversion, swayed by profit or loss, nor touched by honor or disgrace. He is far beyond the cares of men, yet comes to hold the dearest place in their hearts. This, therefore, is the highest state of man. The title of the chapter is Living by Silent Knowing. Hold hold on a second, Marla. I want to talk about the translation he used here for a minute. Uh, brought out something that wasn't brought out in the other translations or that I didn't didn't pick up on. Look at this. It says the the sage that does this practice of blocking the passages, closing the mouth, the senses, the sharpness, all those things. That doesn't talk. Uh, well, that's a description, really, that he he. Uh, those who know don't talk, and those that talk don't know is a description of what's going on in the second stanza. But as a result of walking this way of the Tao, uh, he is not moved by attachment or aversion. What a gift not to be moved by attachment. Yeah, that's what I said at the beginning. Is yeah. There's no attachment to whether we do the right thing or not. We don't expect rewards or awards or accolades. Not or, not yeah. or swayed by profit or loss. Yeah. That is my life. I've always been so, oh, I need to do that because it makes me money. I need to, do the, I need to quit doing this because I lost money doing that. Not swayed by profit or loss. I don't know. Is that really talking about money? I don't think so, but I was always swayed by something that made me look better, feel better. Yeah, that's what, you, you know, know, all those yeah. things, you know, and money too, you know, the whole thing, you know, I I'm would sure. quit, you know, I, I gauge what I should be doing in life by whether it profited me or whether it caused me loss in everything. And often men's egos are tied up in how much money they make. Oh, yes. Nor touched by honor or disgrace. It's hitting all the buttons, isn't it? Attachment, profit loss, honor or disgrace. He is far beyond the cares of men. I am not even, I mean, I'm not even beyond, much less far beyond. (laughs) Far beyond the cares of men. Now, thinking about step three in that, turning our will and our life over to the care of God as we misunderstand him. And this really is talking about that, I think, in this beyond the care. Because, you know, for me, step three is not only me turning over my will, but it's all the things I'm concerned about. All the cares and concerns, my love for my family, my concern with making a living, my concern with honor and disgrace, my concern with attack, all those things I'm to turn over and to trust my higher power with. And he's beyond all of that. He's uh, The sage has done step three in its fullest, okay? He's beyond that. And I like, this is the part that I didn't see in any of the others, yet comes to hold the dearest place in their hearts. So the sage is not moved by attachment or profit or loss or honor and disgrace. He's beyond 
what men think about him, but yet he holds the dearest place in their hearts. I think that's, Kate, what you were talking about is part of that, in that when we surrender our need, the things that we think are important, Mm -hmm. and we're giving, then I think what happens is that vulnerability that we have, in because that's a vulnerable place to be. When you're doing for someone and they have the power to advance or hurt you in some way, but you're vulnerable, when, when you're there, I think being in that place is what causes the real magic to happen, is that place of powerlessness, really. Does that make sense? Yeah. But that's interesting. It says they hold yet. It looks like it would be the opposite, you know, that if you're not concerned, that you're not attached, you're not, you know, you're, you know, you're not trying to please them in any way. You're far beyond even being concerned with what they think. But yet, you hold the dearest place in their hearts. Not that they hold the dearest place in your heart. <laughs> does that, a powerful place to be. Yeah. Does that speak to anyone? It's, yeah, it becomes a, actually a powerful place to be without not being yeah. sucked into the power of it. <laughs> yeah. And it says, therefore... This, therefore, is the highest state of man. It's the highest state of man to be here. So how do we get there? Well, first thing is we learn to start giving instead of getting. We start learning to respond with, respond to energy with, uh, with to injury with kindness. Those things that we're learning. And then, he talks a lot about this. So you want to read on, Marla? Uh, that's all I have there. Anyone got any comments? Okay, we'll keep going. All right, so this is probably the best-known verse of the Tao Te Ching. In fact, the opening two lines, those who know do not talk, and those who talk do not know, are so popular that they've almost become a cliché. Nevertheless, the passage's essential message is little understood and rarely practiced. Lao Tzu is calling you to live in the highest state of silent knowing, that place deep within you that that can't be communicated to any other. Consequently, you might want to change your thinking about whom you consider to be wise or learned. And whenever we read these, I'm always thinking about who do I hold in the highest regard? Um, Persuasive speaking I'm sorry, persuasive speakers with a good command of the language who are forceful in their pronouncements and confident in their point of view are generally considered to have superior knowledge. But Lao Tzu suggests precisely the opposite is true. Those who talk, he says, aren't living from the place of silent knowing, so they do not know. As you modify the way you look at this presumption, you'll see several differences in the way your world appears. First, you'll note that those who are compelled to pontificate and persuade are almost always attached, are almost always tied to an attachment of some kind. Perhaps it's to a point of view, to being right, to winning, or to profiting in some way. And the more talking they do, the more they appear to be swayed by such attachments. Second thing you'll notice takes place within you you begin to see your inclination and desire to persuade and convince others. Then you begin to listen more attentively, finding yourself in the secret embrace of the primal union that Lao Tzu describes. You need to be knowledgeable or dominant. Your need to be knowledgeable or dominant is replaced by the deep realization that it's all irrelevant, and you lose interest in seeking approval. That's a tough one. Living in silent knowing becomes a process that casts your existence in a different light. You have less of an edge and feel settled, softer, and more centered. Hold on right there, Marla. See, this, I think, is that process of change that starts happening when we start giving instead of looking to get. 
your need to be knowledgeable or dominant is placed by a deep realization that it's all irrelevant and you lose interest in seeking approval. Wow. That care, that care of men, right? Far beyond living in silent knowing becomes the process that casts your existence in a different light. You have less of an edge and feel settled, softer, and more centered. And that, oh. and that previous paragraph you highlighted, buddy, I just that uh, note that those who are compelled to pontificate and persuade are almost always tied to an attachment of some kind. Boy, I can't help but think of politicians when I read that. Yeah, me too. Me too. Me too. I think of, about you know our politicians who are ruining, <laughs> who, who believe that they're right. But I mean, they always have to. You always have to. You always read about their approval ratings, and they're yeah. always you know seeking approval and. Uh, well, I just, it just made me think of that. That's a politician's life, unfortunately. Um, Anyone else? Yeah, I. it made me think of my grandmother. Like, my grandmother versus my parents, which is something I've thought about a lot in the last year, is, like, she was unconditional love. And by all accounts, like, I mean... She lost her husband with God, seven kids. She was a widow. He was abusive. She had every right to be a very angry, bitter woman, and that was not who she became. And my parents were kind of the opposite of that. Like, I mean, they had the same reasons sort of in different ways, but they held on to that bitterness. And it was like when you encountered her, it was just love. And she would give everybody everything, whether she had it to give or not. And my parents sort of held on to everything very tightly. And that was sort of how I became, was you had to hold on to it because you might need it, right? So you can't give it away. And they're that way in their relationships. Like if you're, if you're friends with them, you can't really be friends with other people, right? Because now there's a reason to be jealous and you can't, like they can't have a relationship with someone where they have a relationship with someone else. And like I've learned as I've extricated myself from them and set some boundaries, like it's so freeing to be like, well, of course you can have friendships with other people. Like I don't own you and you don't own me. And I get different things from different relationships and it's not about what I get. And it's just like, it's take, I mean, she died when I was 12 and it's taken me 35 years to see like just the wisdom that was within her that I didn't realize at the time. I just knew it was love. That's what she gave period. It's a good example. Thank you, Cindy. All right. I, when I talk it, about her, you know, it started me thinking about, um, you know, my, my grandparents who were part of the Holocaust generation and their bitterness and depression and they live through the depression as well, but you know they had all of these things to be really bitter about, and they held on to it, you know. And it and it, then it goes down to the next generation. Um, fortunately, my parents raised each other, and they they're happy people. But um, you know, I, I didn't. My grandparents, neither side, were unconditional love. They had a, an edge of sadness and bitterness about them. And kind of rightly so, but I understand now the people, there's people who overcame, like Viktor Frankl, who lived in, who lived in concentration camps, um, you know, how he overcame it by just changing his whole perception of having hope. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and that, every time I read a story, like, I, I didn't see it in her. I saw it in, like, things that I read. And I was like, okay, like my, you know, you read these horror stories of things people have lived through and then they're really positive. And I was like, well, who am I to not like, let it go <laughs> to use buddy's expression all the time. Who am I not to let it go? Right. And then I really thought about, I have those examples in my life. And when I look at my aunts and uncles and my parents, it's so interesting to me as an observer to see how it's like a 50, 50 split. Like, half of the kids are super positive, and they just exude love, and about half of them are not. And, and it's, you know, it, it's just interesting. And, you know, there's a lot of addiction and alcoholism in the family and all that stuff, too. But it's a, it's a choice. 
And I don't think anybody ever tells you it's a choice. Like you have it, you have a choice. You can make a choice to hold on to the, to the anger and the bitterness and the hurt and the everything and have that be who you are, or you can let it go. <laughs> no, no one ever shared that with me. It's, no, me neither. Yeah. yeah okay. Cindy, I think we had the same grandma, Cindy. Um, my, <laughs> my grandma was like a lot like that too, the unconditional love. And she was, she came up through the depression and her and my grandpa, they never really had much money at all. And I just remember when I was a little kid, uh, the town they lived in, they lived close to some railroad tracks. And there were often some homeless, some you'd call them hobos, I guess, that used to ride the trains. And they would come and they would knock on my grandma's door and she would feed them. <laughs> and I was like, you know, why are you doing that? <laughs> you know, these are dirty, you know, probably drunk bums and she said well you know they need a meal like everybody else right that's amazing so i just you know that that always stuck with me you know that, that she that's would do awesome. that you know? and they, you know they didn't you know they oftentimes it's not like they had a lot to eat themselves i mean they were scr scr scripping and saving every penny and she you know she grew her own vegetables and stuff and uh but yeah she just always she would just always give them a handout and um that's awesome. That I try to be like that too, but um, that's really awesome. I when my my step grandma was a hoarder. She grew up. She was part of the depression. All she did was hoard things. And when when she would feed us for dinner, if there were six of us, you know, she put out six slices of bread. And that's it. Yeah, not, I mean, that's not all she fed us, but she was, you know, very not generous. I guess in her. And food is an act of, of love and generosity. Right. Yes. Especially when you don't have enough. Right. Paul, that's interesting that that's one of the things that you remember about your grandmother. If you could do the top five things you remember, they're all probably ways that she gave. Yeah. Yeah, and she would, she would also uh, give to the local this was back like in the seventies and before all these food pantries and stuff would pop up and she would just, if she had some extra can of beans that she wasn't using, she would say, Paul, she'd give me a bag. She'd say, take this over to the neighbor. Huh. That's awesome. And again, I was like, okay, you know, I didn't, you know, I didn't, it's like, all right. <laughs> but that's, that's interesting, isn't it? The things that we remember that are important to us are the ways that, people gave not the ways that they got or tried to that's the great things that we remember uh, reminds me of a quote from uh, Peter asked Jesus this is not in the Bible this is in the Nag Hammadi um, he said how do I have peace in life and he told him he says well he says what you have to do is abandon the works that do not follow you into eternal life abandon the things that are just about here and now you know like being being better more stuff you know all those selfishness stuff right and abandoning those things and doing what we're talking about he says you you focus on the things that follow you not the things that don't and the things that follow you are the ways that we give the ways that we love you know, it's about um, how you make people feel. That's how you remember people's, how they made you feel. And that's what I've been working on is how do I make people feel so that, not that they remember me, but that they feel good. That's part of giving yeah. is making somebody else feel good. It's just nobody does that. It's not about how they make us feel. It's how, no. about how we make them feel. No, and that's how, you know, I have to approach teaching yoga as well, is how do I make them feel, not whether I, they get into a pose or not. But, they, yeah, it's, it's coming, from, coming from a completely different place. It's, how can I make somebody feel good today? The only way I can love people is by being on this higher level of love. I can't do it out of fear. No. I certainly can't do it out of resentment. <laughs> I can't, you know, I've got to bring that level of consciousness up to love. 
And the way, and for me, the way I do that is really simple. It is so simple. I don't have have a magic formula and all of this, you know, meditating three hours a day and all, you know, all kinds of stuff. I just start doing it. <laughs> I just start doing it. What does the Lord's Prayer say that at a lot of meetings that they close the meeting with or that we learn, you know, if we, from the Christian side, if we learn this, it says, uh, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us, right? So we take the action to forgive first. We act our way into right thinking. So I think this is, this, for me, this has been the same way. Mm-hmm. When I'm in a situation and I don't want to love, I do it anyway if I'm right sized. Yeah, that's why you need to do it. Yes, Paul, exactly. <laughs> I told a sponsor yesterday, we, we went and ate lunch. I said, you know, I said, I want you to try something for me. He said, what? I said, I want you to try just one time doing the opposite of what you want to do. I said, you know, I said, that is going to be the right thing for you to do. <laughs> I said, just do the opposite of what you want to do. I said, I guarantee you it'll t- turn out better. Yeah. And I, I don't know if you heard me or not. We'll see. But but that really is the case, Paul. You're right. I have to read this one line. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Marla. I'm sorry. Okay. I didn't mean to interrupt. We... In Dwyer. Those who care the least about approval seem to receive it the most. That That's the whole, that sums it all, sums a lot of it up for me. Don't, so, the rest goes on to say, since such individuals aren't concerned with how they're perceived, either honorably or in disgrace, they don't seek praise or run from it. While their calm wisdom may make them appear to be aloof, they actually end up gaining the respect of everyone. Hear that, Kate? Yeah. That's what you're looking for right there, dear. That's it. Yeah. Cindy, and your job, too. I want to, real quick, he does a good job here. I'm going to run through this really fast on what this blunt your sharpness, untie your knot, soften your glare, settle your dust. Um, On blunt your sharpness, he's talking, uh, according to Dyer, and this makes sense to me, uh, do this by listening to yourself before you let your judgments attack someone else. So, and untie your knots, detach from what keeps you tied in worldly patterns. Untie the knots that bind you to life that's dedicated to showing profit and demonstrating victory and replace them with silent contemplating the Tao in the secret embrace. Soften your glare. Notice when you need to be right is glaringly obvious and let, yeah, let the soft underside of your being replace your rigid stance. So when you start trying to push and pull, That's a warning that you need to soften your glare. You need to relax. Settle your dust. Don't kick it up in the first place. Realize your inclination to stir up dust when you feel a diatribe about to erupt on how others ought to be behaving. Wow. Just let it settle. All of this is calming, settling, letting go. All those things that we are learning. Um, in his da- Do the Tao Now, there's just one line here I'd like to read. Practicing, uh, practicing not giving unsolicited advice. Stop yourself for an instant and call upon your silent knowing. Unsolicited advice. That's a good place to start. Comments before we end? Everyone in a good place? That was good. Good. Scott, good to have you today, sir. I know you came in after I announced everyone. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, if there's nothing else, guys, we'll just call it there. I think I covered everything that uh, everything I wanted. I don't have any notes that we didn't talk about. This giving myself up continually really is the, the key to this. If I had to 
for me, if I had to break it down to one little, one little phrase is, it's back to that same thing. How can I give in whatever I'm doing? See, that doesn't work for you. I'd like to hear Kate and Cindy, if, uh, if you start seeing a change in what you're doing when you, when you're coming from a place of love in that, I, I would be curious to know. So everyone I'm good? Working, I'm working tomorrow. I'll try it. Cool. Cool. Well, you know what the problem is when you get a situation like this, or when you get a teaching like this, I'm going to have this all weekend is what you're telling me. <laughs> you go to school now. Okay. Now, well, really you've been in school. Now it's time for the test. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, I'm working that's, that's, Friday and Sunday, so I'll get lots of practice. <laughs> <laughs> so let us know, dear. I will. All right. Y'all have a great week. You too. All right. Bye. Bye. <laughs>Thank you for listening to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. For more information about the RRC, the Recovery Revolution Community, go to omarpinto.com and click on the link that says Recovery Revolution Community. Once you join the RRC, you'll be able to participate in this meeting and many more live, plus access to a video library of past meetings and many more benefits for being a part of this growing community. Thanks again for listening. And if you enjoyed this episode, please share this podcast with your friends in recovery.